Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Unica student webinar. Very happy to have you all here. Um, this webinar is hosted by Unica and Nova University Lisbon. And I would like to invite uh, Professor João Mar de Matos, who is the Vice Director of um, Nova University Lisbon, and then Luciana Sazu, who is the President of Unica, to give you the, um, the official welcome and opening of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Joana. Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, this is a conference for students, and we would like to listen to the students to hear their opinions. My presence here is just to give you a warm welcome. As you know, most of you, we were planning a big uh, European uh, University students here in Lisbon this year. The pandemic, unfortunately, prevented us from doing that. We postponed this meeting for next year. But uh, UNICA, uh, Professor Luciano Sasso, who is uh, head of UNICA, challenged us with the organization of this uh, webinar with the students. And I thought it was a wonderful opportunity, a unique timing for, you know, putting this into practice. Everybody now is talking through webinars, through internet. And actually, since this is a student's conference, this is your time. This is internet time. This is uh, new technology times. Students actually master this kind of technology much better than old faculty members like myself. So although I feel very happy and comfortable to receive you all in this network with the initiative of UNICA and Nova University Lisbon, I think that the success of this meeting is really in your hands, in your minds, and in your youth power. So I wish you all the best for discussing these topics that we aligned together with you in the previous meetings. Uh, I think that these topics are very, very relevant and significant. It's about your future. It's about your training. It's about your competences. So I think that you will have very interesting things to tell us about your expectations, your perspectives, and your hopes for the future and for our role as universities. This is where we really have to learn from you. So I wish you all the best, and I will pass the floor at this point to Luciano Sasso, who will talk on behalf of UNICA. So on behalf of NOVA, very welcome. Thanks. Oh. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luciano Sazo. I'm a vice rector at Sapienza University of Rome and I'm president of UNICA. I would like to thank uh, very much uh, the University Nova de Lisboa for hosting this very important webinar, especially Professor Joao Amaro de Matos, the vice rector who just spoke, and uh, Joana Guedes, uh, who really did a lot for the organization of this meeting together with the Secretariat of UNICA in Brussels with uh, Laura Brossico, very active there. I want to thank uh, several uh, organizations of students who uh, made this event possible. Of course, first of all, the students from NOVA, very active, uh, working very well together with the ESU, with the ESN, with the IYNF, uh, in putting together, I have to say, in a few weeks, uh, an amazing program. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit the general context. Uh, UNICA is an association of universities, uh, universities are based in the capital cities. Uh, we have at the moment uh, 53 universities in 36 countries. So we have uh, all uh, European Union countries with the only exception of Malta and many other uh, non-European uh, Union countries. So I really uh, know that there are students from all over Europe attending this webinar. I'm so happy that you, know, you can share uh, views and ideas from, uh, again, uh, students from Lisbon to Moscow to uh, Iceland to Cyprus. So we try to cover uh, the, the the whole continent. And UNICA, um, you know, organizes several activities for the leadership of the universities, for international relations officers, for uh, different other types of uh, representatives. But we are also uh, very focused on activities for students. We are one of the few associations organizing uh, very regular student events. Uh, we have uh, this important student conference that until now in the last uh, 20 years has been organized you know, with in-person 
meetings every two or three years with uh, participation of 250, 300 students from all uh, UNICA members. And this is the first webinar. So this is a new era. Unfortunately, in this tragedy of COVID-19, uh, you know, the, there were many issues, you know, related to the, the health and uh, uh, we, are, we are so sorry about uh, all uh, uh, people who uh, lost their lives and their relatives, etc. Uh, but uh, for universities, for for networks, uh, this COVID-19 also brought, uh, uh, you know, this uh, digital shock, uh, this uh, new, uh, I would say, era in which uh, webinars uh, are becoming more popular. Uh, distance learning is uh, becoming becoming the, the general rule. So I think for students uh, uh, within Unica there are opportunities to organize uh, more events like this one. So I encourage all of you to come up with proposals. Uh, you know, we are really very much uh, looking forward to listening to, to you. Uh, I would just want to give you an example that after the uh, UNICA student conference in 2010, the students uh, asked UNICA to become more active in the sustainable development activities. And we created a special working group of experts, academics and also administrative and technical experts working on sustainable development. And this is now is a very active group of UNICA called UNICA Green. So this is just an example that if you come up with a very good proposals with ideas, uh, you know, we would like to, to listen to you to you and uh, do more activities uh, very relevant for, for students because of course universities exist because students are there. All the other activities are and should be around the uh, student uh, you know, uh, activities. So again, thank you very much uh, to all of you. Thank you very much to all uh, students also online in this moment, participating again from different countries. And also I'm looking forward to this uh, seminar to listening to what you will present and discuss and uh, I'm sure that I will learn a lot. Okay, so again, good luck and welcome from Unica. Thank you very much, Luciano. And uh, now we'll have uh, Laura from Unica. We'll give you a, a brief intro into our agenda and explain a little bit uh, how the day, the afternoon is gonna go. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, Jana. Uh, so yes, just a very quick overview. All of you should have received it because we sent an email even today to all the participants. Uh, so the, the webinar will be organizing three sessions on uh, three topics. The first one, the future of the academic job market for university graduates and European mobility in the post-COVID-19 era. This session will be moderated by Kali Wentling from Nova University in Lisbon. A second session will focus on distance learning and the lessons learned during the pandemics and also lessons for the future to build the future. This session will be moderated by Anna Klamper from the European Students' Union. And session three will be about the future of the social impact of universities and will be moderated by Pari Bagheri from the International Young Nature Friends. Uh, throughout the presentations, the participants will have the possibility to pose questions via Mentimeter uh, and the question will be then discussed in a question and answer session. Uh, the moderators of each session will uh, explain how, how to, to send comments on the presentation so through a call the, at the beginning of each session. Uh, we also would like to inform you that the session is being recorded, but since, uh, well, okay, so if you don't want to, to appear, you just, uh, you can just uh, switch your camera off. Uh, and so welcome, we are very happy to have all these people online and uh, we can uh, get started. So <laughs> it's uh, to Kali Wentling from NOVA uh, to start with introduction to the first session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, hello and welcome to the first session on the future of the academic job market for university graduates and the future of the European mobility in the post-COVID-19 era. Uh, my name is Callie Wentling and I'm a student of the Geographic Information Systems program at NOVA Information Management School in Lisbon, Portugal, and I'll be the monitor, uh, moderator for session one today. Um, the session has two presentations that I will introduce shortly. Uh, but first, I'd like to call your attention to Mentimeter, which is how we will be gathering audience questions for the panel discussions after the presentations. 
If you'd like to participate, please navigate to menti.com and enter the code 1329. Um, I've just shared these instructions in the chat for reference. Feel free to contribute questions for our panel or upvote the questions of others that you'd like to see addressed during the discussion. So first up, we have Joanna Rubel uh, light from ESN. Joanna is a civil engineer specializing in the field of sustainable mobility. She is a liaison officer of the Erasmus Student Network, and her portfolio is quality education and SDGs. Today, she is sharing her team's research on the impact of COVID-19 in mobility in Europe in her presentation, The Impact of COVID-19 on Student Exchanges. Take it away, Joanna. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in this presentation, I'm going just to give you an overview of the research that we did in, uh, in ESN. So as you uh, may know, uh, COVID-19 impacted a lot of things, including learning mobility. And in ESN, we wanted to support international students the best way that we could. And so we decided to understand the impact in their lives uh, that the pandemic created especially in the part of mobility. So uh, regarding the, the methodology, um, the, um, the survey was opened from the, can you, can you change the slide please? Thank you. The survey was opened from, from the 19th to the 30th of March. So it was, uh, it was well, two weeks. And we were able to collect 2,000 answers from international students, majority in Europe. So the, the research was very focused on Europe. And um, the majority of the answers collected were from uh, Erasmus Plus uh, participants. So mostly students, but as well, we had answers from, from the trainee program where, and, uh, and so on. Um, regarding the impact, we can see some, some statistics here. Um, as so, um, majority of the, the mobilities, they continued. However, some were canceled in the beginning. And as you, we will be able to see afterwards, mobility continuing, it doesn't mean that, well, students have classes. So I can, I think we can guess that we had uh, a big adaptation in our learning uh, environments and our learning methodology. So we, we went for, for online uh, virtual well, mobility. Um, regarding um, the students, um, they decided, most of them decided to stay in the, their destination, their mobility destination. Um, it's the, the, the next slide. Um, however, during the time of the survey, we were able to see that the number decreased. So students were going back home mostly by the end. Um, and this is, this doesn't mean that mobilities were canceled again. We had, um, a lot of mobilities that continued, even though the students were at their home country, which is very curious. Then here, uh, we can see like 5% classes continuing as normal, probably because of the timing of the survey, because it, it was by the end of the March, but majority of the, the universities were able to, to provide an online option or fully or partially. However, um, it is uh, crucial to, to highlight that despite the fact of having online learning and online classes and online mobility, we were still missing one part. In terms, when, when regarding Erasmus Plus and uh, the enriching experiencing, uh, experience of going abroad and studying in another university, the part of going abroad is crucial for the development of some specific skills. What does this mean? So, we can acquire the knowledge uh, online. So we can go to classes and acquire the knowledge in the academic level. We, but the students are not able to develop some crucial skills that will make the difference in the job market that they would develop um, when, uh, if in uh, Erasmus Plus, but uh, abroad. 
this is very important to highlight when defining the next steps of of the program so the the next short steps will be blended mobility which is cool very nice however it is important to to understand that virtual mobility does not substitute physical mobility then we had some practical um, um, problems and we decided to tackle very quickly finances. So the majority of the students didn't know how, how, the, um, how the grants would go, uh, how to cover their expenses by this time. And this is, this is very, very um, uh, important to highlight. And this is a very important part for, for universities to understand what they should do if something if this is going to be repeated. So students cannot be wondering if they will have money to pay for the accommodation that they committed for or the transportation that they committed for. Then um, as well, the majority of the, of the, the problems experienced, well, uh, transportation. So people didn't know how to move, how to go back to, to their home country. They couldn't fly. They had to, they were uh, constantly being, um, having their flights canceled and so on and so forth. But this is something that it's very transversal for, for people that, for example, were working and they wanted to come back to, to their home countries. And well, we didn't know. Then in the, the sport uh, received, most of the, of the, the students, had um, their, their, they had support. However, the, um, the part that the group that they, they identified most was family and friends, that's normal. However, the universities, still the universities were, were uh, supporting the students, but not every student identified that as you can see in the, in the next slide. Um, so, um, as you can see, for example, uh, host university was almost only half of the students ish. And this is a bit, um, well, triggering why, because we have the, the basis of the mobility programs and universities were not supporting, but why did this happen? We don't know, but probably because everyone was trying their best and it was a very complicated situation. We just hope that everyone can learn from it. Then about um, as well the information, um, uh, well, they hide um, information on health and safety available. However, only 50% uh, identified that they had sufficient information in English, which can be a bit um, complicated for, for international students. And yes, we have, uh, for example, one, one, of the one of the examples is um, a Dutch student in Portugal that was not able to, to understand what the host university was saying because it was everything in Portuguese. Um, so very important, very quickly, what we learned from this. Um, uh, can, can you pass the slide one, please? And the other one? Thank you. Um, very important to keep the, the language as inclusive, inclusive as, as possible. Um, so English, when we're communicating with international students, um, if we are pushing for international environment, internationalization of higher education, we have to be as, as inclusive as possible. One of the, the points that was very, very, um, uh, well, that students struggle a lot was with the accommodation, as as we we can imagine, because accommodation is already a, pro, a problem when everything is normal. Let's imagine when we have to leave, and we have a lot of commitment from this side, and it was very hard, and we had to put a lot of money on it. So, basically, we must look again for for the part of accessibility and and information and how how to better support and how to to better uh change our our measures then um the funding uh, we had a lot of students that were wondering 
how they will pay your things, how uh, they they will get the support, financial support they would need for 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 this uh, for the mobility itself, but to to fight uh, the the pandemic as they could. Um, and then online facilitating uh, facilitation. So very important in uh, online learning is that it is um, the, the access is equal. So as well, we would have we will have to to take a look on the the, the tools that we we are using and if everyone has it and, as them and so on. And as well, uh, it's very important to understand the impact of the pandemic and to do uh, an assessment of the impact in order to, to know how to answer long term. And finally, uh, it is crucial uh, to cooperate um, in order to um, unify and to um, be one despite diversities. And yeah, so I think this is it for me. Thank you so much, Joanna, uh, for your recap of the initial and continuing challenges experienced by the exchange students in the face of COVID-19. Um, we'll look forward to hearing more during the discussion portion. Um, as a reminder, any questions can be submitted through menti.com with the code 1329 uh, throughout this session. Um, check the chat for more information about this. And next up, we have Joao Fernandes from ISCTE. Joao is currently studying in the Masters of Management of Services and Technology in ISCTE Business School in Lisbon. He also holds a Bachelor in Management from the same university. Furthermore, Joao is the president of the ISCTE Student Union that represents around 10,000 students and focuses on enriching their academic path. Today, Joao will be speaking about the new era in the job market for Generation Z. Take it away, Joao. Hello everyone, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. Okay, so I'm here, I'm talking about the new era that we'll face, the generation Z, that is our generation, my generation, and we're gonna face a new job market uh, from the next couple of years. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to introduce uh, the generation, who, who are the generation Z. Um, so, Wait. Okay, uh, so it's the people that were born um, between the, the second half of the, the 90s until the 2010. Uh, we were created in the boom of the technology devices and in the internet, internet development. And so there, our main characteristics are the easy techno technology comprehension and our openness to, to new IT uh, technologies but it's also very important our socially conscious generation um we have seen in the past weeks um, examples like what happened uh, in the united states and in other countries that we are really concerned about uh, issues related to the society and even to the environment so is our uh, big characteristics of this generation that will be a, a reflect on the job market and regarding this, um, I, have, I have some couple of examples uh, gave by some big co corporations that are, have studied uh, the Generation Z and their first step on the job market. Um, so for many of us, is going to be our first job. Uh, some others are already working and others still in high school or university to study. So some data very important to, to this analysis is that 92% of the, um, the Generation Z, according to a, a sample of 4,000 uh, participants, uh, they are concerned about this generation gap that is caused by the technology between the professional and the personal life. And even 37% uh, consider that technology is weakening the ability to maintain a strong uh, interpersonal uh, relationship and the development of uh, people uh, qualities. Uh, this generation is also very concerned, as I said, uh, with the global impact about social uh, concerns, and they are very concerned on creating uh, their own view and 
change the, the way that the world works and they want to do that on their future jobs. Another big interesting characteristic uh, of this generation is their primary goal in working there is a job security. Uh, according to this data, this is a big concern because uh, this generation faced the 2008 crisis and is facing now the COVID pandemic uh, relationship. So therefore, uh, the first step in each job that these people will have uh, is gonna be the job security. And this, this is also very interesting that nowadays uh, concerning other uh, generations, uh, we don't really want to spec a, a long-term a uh, job on the same company would then want to change. And this is also uh, very interesting. And uh, it also reflects that nowadays uh, we are always trying to, to share, uh, share more information about the companies. We make a search very deep when it comes to, to, to our first job. We try to know better the personal experience of people that work there and even that uh, how are the values, the culture of the company. And when it comes to the, the interview, we are already very aware of how that company works. Uh, but things changed and COVID uh, made a big uh, change on the, our daily routine and even in the work. And that is some of the conclusions that McKinsey uh, made on a recent study. Uh, we have seen it, we, see, we saw that e-commerce was a big presence in our daily routine already for young teenagers, but uh, they also saw that is becoming a, a path in older people. Um, as example, China that faced this virus um, before us, uh, they said that uh, older people with more than 36 years are starting to use more the e-commerce and buying more online and is creating a change on the customer experience. The online retailer is raising uh, and that is also so, it was uh, analyzed in Europe recently and it, it came to the same conclusion as China. Uh, it's also very important to notice that uh, things are changing here in Europe and in the other um, big, big countries. Uh, United States of America is uh, changing and is most of the typical works in the service, in the hospitality and retail are changing. Uh, now uh, there are many um, works that will disappear in the past, in the following years. And the grocery companies are becoming bigger. Uh, companies like Uber uh, created a, a new program that is really good, that is the work up that allows the drivers to, to do simultaneous working for Uber and do also other tasks to other companies and they are increasing their, their need for, for more people working to them. As an example also, uh, France and Japan uh, are changing their value chain. So they are pulling up the, the factories close to, the com to their customers instead of depending all on China. So are creating more job mobility close to their house and we are seeing these changes. The most frequently change that we all think everyone knows is the, the fact that more people are working from home, uh, some of them 100%, but most of the companies uh, hope to, to create a, a hybrid solution where people can work offline and uh, online. Um, so there is creating a new organization dynamics, more e-learning trends since in the in the following months, most of uh, young workers will need to have um, uh, some training from home and then go to the company. And some processes are changing and becoming made online. International meetings, instead of traveling one place to another, they're gonna be do like today, Zoom, a Zoom connection. And this is also creating new soft skills required for us, for this generation. Uh, there is this critical digital and cognitive capabilities. There is the ability to, to maintain a physical relation with our workers, but simultaneously be able to have this online connection. And some of the characteristics that are, I think, uh, from the past, from the present, and from the, the future of any worker is uh, our adaptability and resilience uh, to the new challenge 
and today we're facing the big one that will change forever our way of working, living, and obviously uh, the social and emotional changes that will be required and the, the ability to, to be to have a culture of the organization that is the fit to our generation X that uh, wants to, generation Z that wants to change uh, the world and hopes that his organization always follows that path. Uh, for ending my presentation, I would like to, to say one of the quotes that I think sum up everything that I was trying to, to transmit to you. There is the generation Z uh, provides digital leaders yet another great opportunity to bring new work styles, creativity, and fre fresh perspectives to work in this arena. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Joao, for your insights about Generation Z, their social motivations, major career concerns, as well as some insights into the changing post-COVID job market. Um, we'd now like to open up the floor to discuss any questions uh, with our panelists. Uh, we have until the top of the hour and we're running ahead of schedule. So please feel free to submit um, some of your questions. We'd love to chat about them. Um, we have some already submitted, but if you have more, feel free to, um, to submit them through menti.com with the code 1329. Uh, Joanna and Joao, are you ready? Yes. Joanna? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, let's see, first up, we have uh, a comment from one of our participants um, about adaptive growth and the fact that this principle will be universal soon. The job market will flourish in a digital and artificial intelligence with robots and drones. Um, any comments from our panelists on this? Um, so I, I think that, uh, yeah, obviously it's going to be the artificial intelligence will, will be a more present on, on the, our work work routine, especially in the industries uh, where the labor will do more analytic work and uh, the machinery will do more of these uh, work. So, and uh, I can give an example. I'm doing my thesis on medicine uh, regarding uh, the hospitals and these nowadays doctors will require more of the artificial intelligence to, to do some of their decisions. And uh, I think this is a path that is not going to be in healthcare, but even in new industries and even in management solutions, uh, we're going to have uh, computers working with us. Uh, I don't think that uh, the artificial intelligence will um, take place of the human decisions. It's going to be a, a parallel work. We need each other to make a better solution. But yes, without a doubt that we're going to see artificial intelligence uh, working more and digital connection, as I, as I told today, Zoom and other techniques of digital cooperation will continue. And obviously robots uh, will um, be present in the in industry, uh, especially. And drones, uh, we, we have an example of, uh, I think it's Amazon that already do some delivers with drones so we i also expect that drones going to be more present um and i think that the the pandemic uh, was the necessary boost to technology to come uh to our the work routine i think that's a very uh, optimistic way to look at it i like your perspective of the collaboration between humans and uh and some of the new technologies that are developing versus some of the scarier uh, possibilities that sometimes we're a little too familiar with, with um, uh, some of these scenarios. So thank you for your insights. And Joanna? Yeah, uh, I'm going to, to uh, agree with Joao. And I'm going to say firstly that I don't understand much about technology. So <laughs> for it to be clear, one thing that uh, uh, I think it's very important to keep in mind is that um, digital development is very important and is crucial. And we could see that during the pandemic. So it was very important indeed. However, uh, technology has to adapt to us instead of the other way around. And one thing that is very important is the, the personal level. So in the connection between humans 
And well, that's why uh, Erasmus Plus is so, so important because people uh, develop the capacity of uh, connecting with uh, other human beings from all over the world, despite the backgrounds. So I would like to, to, um, to, to, to believe that yes, uh, technology is very important. Yes, we have to uh, try to readapt our, our um, education methods and components. However, uh, it won't replace and we, I think we have a space for both. I hope so. I hope so too. Um, kind of in that light and talking about how we're adapting programs, um, should universities reform their study programs um, to prepare students for the digital job environment? And, and what does that look like? How might that happen? What are your ideas for how that might develop? I can start. Uh, if it's that's okay, yeah. yeah okay. Um, so uh, definitely, uh, we have to to adapt our our programs, our curriculum. It's um, it was uh, already important before the pandemic. So for us, it's normal to to learn uh, how to how to master a computer and so on, but it's not for everyone, and it's something that is crucial now to find a job. So if we don't know how to work with a computer, how to work with Excel or Word or PowerPoint, we won't get a job. And at least a, a one that you can, you can grow. Um, and now that we are not only reinventing um, how uh, education goes in universities and in schools, we are as well looking at how the job environment uh, is going to transform and it's transforming as well and in the development of, of the employee. So it's very important as well to have uh, an um, uh, awareness of lifelong learning and how we are now developing our students so they can enter uh, the, the, um, the, their job in an environment, in a digital uh, environment, and then they can uh, grow. Thank you for that. And uh, Joao, what are your thoughts? Um, I think also it's going to be important uh, to introduce to have an introduction about digital um, technology on our university path. Uh, especially people ca cannot think that uh, engineers have to do everything about IT. IT is present in everything we do nowadays in every work. So we need to have bases. Everyone. Obviously, more complex situations will be the engineers and the informatic workers, uh, but we need something is like uh, Joanna said, the Word, Excel. We all need that uh, tools for our daily routines, and no one expect that in the future uh, we'll still use a simple solution like a paper uh, to do some of our tasks. So, yes, it's going to be necessary to have a. a a radical change on our um, academic uh, work, uh, academic uh, uh, curricular disciplines. Uh, but I also expect that create a, a space uh, for older people uh, because I think, as I said, the generation uh, Z uh, is more aware and prepared to have a techno technology change on on their life but older people are not so prepared to that. So it's important also that we change in our universities for the new generations, but also prepare the older ones because they also work with us and they have a lot of experience to share with the younger people. And they also need to have this qualification in the digital environment. Wonderful insights. It would absolutely be a shame, I think, to lose the insights of older generations just to a generational technological gap. Um, so thank you for that. Um, let's see what else we have here. Looks like we have some great questions coming in. Um, let's start here. Actually, I think we just answered that question. Um, Uh, do you think if the Erasmus Exchange becomes a digital exchange program, um, can the program survive or will it become an unnecessary element of our, our current education system? Anyone want to start? Yeah, I can start. Uh, 
So uh, in ESN, we do not like to think of that possibility uh, because as I previously said, uh, if we go totally uh, for virtual mobility, we will lose the part of developing personal competences. And one thing that we, we have to agree on is that our younger generations, they are not very good uh, uh, with uh, interpersonal connections because of the, um, the, the addiction, not addiction, but uh, the dependence to, to technology. So I, I believe uh, and we believe that um, Erasmus has an important role for, for, the, um, for youth and the kids that they're going to be our leaders very, very soon for, for the de development of personal competences. However, um, if we would go totally digital, I think the academic part, just the academic part, the knowledge, yes, it would be uh, good. Students would uh, learn, we would have exchange of knowledge. This is very important because it has plus. Yes, of course, it is a personal experience. However, it is as well, exchange of knowledge and we for for an international world we have to to exchange knowledge so we would still have that part and i think it would survive but uh if we can keep the 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 physical uh, component i think not only would survive that would be um a very healthy uh, program and to to keep on growing I would totally tend to agree that knowledge exchange, we see it already with, you know, asynchronous MOOCs, massive online courses. Um, they can be very effective in transferring that knowledge, but certainly kind of that camaraderie or those soft skills, that interpersonal element is often lost. And Joao, anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I also, I have done Erasmus on the past, I've been in Zagreb, uh, but I gotta say that uh, even though the digital tools uh, will be a complement on this on this mobility program. I think that is still necessary to be um, the offline component that is be with the with the other students to know each other. I think that is uh, one of the the main main things that I come up when I remember Erasmus. So we feel lose that comp that part. We lose a little bit of the Erasmus spirit. Uh, even though the digital tool can increase and improve our academic uh, experience, but the interaction between the the people from different countries is what I remember more from uh, this experience. Thank you, Joao, for your insights. Um, <laughs> I would tend to agree there as well. Um, so let's see what we have next. Um, Oh, here's a great one. Uh, do you think the previous generations, which are in the leading positions in companies, will be welcoming to these new sets of skills from Gen Z or um, are constraints expected? And how might we overcome these issues? Um, so I think um, I think that's going to be complicated, uh, especially in tradition, traditional uh, service industries. Uh, we are not used to, to use of technology and once again I will talk a little bit about my, my the thesis I am doing uh, for example in the healthcare service um, older people tend to, to do not accept so well the the use of technology and always the new people have to help them to use and they still very want to use paper instead of this change. So I expect that in traditional sectors where there are older people, um, this is gonna be a little bit hard to change, but in the majority, I think big companies and companies that are uh, here to change the world are companies that are always changing to, to offer what the client wants. Uh, I think that Generation Z is seen as the, um, a big contribute to the change of the company and a big active um, to, to change uh, the work, the productive inside of the company and even uh, on, the, um, on the culture of the company. So I think is the, the, the two worlds gonna be, 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 I think they will be very welcome 
uh, on companies like the ones I've explained the examples of McKinsey and Deloitte that made these the studies I, I analyzed. Uh, I think that companies that have an eye on the future uh, will, will welcome very well and will adapt to the Generation Z view uh, of the world. Thank you for that. I think that's great. Um, it looks like Joanna has something to say on the topic. Yes, um, I think uh, uh, totally agree, of course. Uh, however, I think that um, businesses uh, that we didn't expect to adapt to the digital format had to adapt in the pandemic. So, and once we are already struggling and the economy is struggling and companies are struggling. So let's imagine the ones that could not adapt so I think we have here two options, or they did and they are going to grow, or they didn't and they learned that they have to. Uh, so I think that they would be welcome, uh, welcoming to, to our set of skills because companies will need this. And they, they will need the digital mindset and know how to, to become everything well online and know how to work um, in that setting. I think this follows the same um, development of, uh, you, well, a few years ago, we would never think that we can we could have super intercultural environments in a company. Like we would work with other countries, but Portugal, well, Portuguese companies will have Portuguese, while Spanish will have Spanish. And now, intercultural environment, it's the rule. So uh, it's the meaning of, of productiveness. So I, I think that the digital part will follow the, the same path. Those are all beautiful examples. We definitely have seen a lot of transition, I think, in terms of the tools people are using and the way that we just expect to know our corporate or our, um, our work environments, both from kind of a technology perspective, as well as who makes up the teams there and what, what some of those social elements look like as well. Thank you both. So a very pointed question to you know this organization, what we're doing here, as well as the topic of this talk. Um, what is the role of, an, of academic networks such as Unica in helping students in these kinds of situations? Um, so, at least this is the, the, the way that we see it. These uh, networks as Unica, they represent uh, higher education institutions. Uh, so they represent uh, the, from the rectory building to the student. So um, it is very important to, to find, to have one voice in a, in a topic. Besides that, the, the these type of networks they connect as for example unica works together with esn because we know the our different roles and that we complement each other so i think that these networks are crucial to support students and understand the side of the universities and what they are struggling with and trying to advocate for, for the rights of the universities and the institution in order to give a better service to the students and then as well to, um, to partner up with other institutions they are doing another work as the ESN or ESU um, and so uh, work together for, for a better purpose. So I, I would think this is the role, so representativeness um, analysis, uh, and then cooperation. Lovely. Joao, any thoughts on the topic? Um, Joana also said everything, but in a, a small, small thing, uh, I think that is important uh, to support. And I was really impressed about the data that Joana showed uh, from the study of ESN. Uh, but I think I want to express that examples like what I'm, what are we doing today? This webin webinar uh, is an example of uh, hope. Is a hope message that although we are closed in our homes, each one in our country, uh, we still can speak, connect with each other from different culture and different uh, nationalities. And this is the most important thing: is 
the flow cannot stop this network that exists, exists from different countries. Um, I would absolutely agree. It's it's pretty incredible what um, the work of the people at these different universities have put together so quickly and then how quickly um, a conference like this has come together to share a lot of those those findings and then take it one step further um, in this type of conversation. Um, so we are running out of time for this session. Um, let's see if we can fit in one last question. Um, Here's an interesting one. Um, how could universities be prepared to educate disadvantaged students online? And would this make the job market more accessible for them? Any thoughts, Joanna yeah. or Joao? Yeah, uh, very shortly. This is a, an important question that I, I I, I think we must repeat it to our universities when talking about online learning is that can your students do it? Do they have the, the material at home? And some students don't, and it's not possible for them. So I think that if universities are pushing, and of course they are in times like this, but if they would like to readapt for the future when this thing is already gone. Um, and now as well, I think universities, I think it's very, very okay. And uh, it brings an important component. However, they, they have to offer to the students the um, equal possibility, well, for everyone. If they have a computer, not okay, but if there is a student that doesn't have a computer and we are pushing for online learning, we have to provide it with him or her with the material. And I think this is very important. So adaptation to, to the, the disadvantaged backgrounds of our students, not for to diminish our, our education, but to empower. This is, um, well, SDG4 uh, in the framework has, has a sentence that I cannot forget which is quality education isn't reached if not reached by all. And this is something that we must keep in mind for this as well. That's really beautiful. Absolutely true. And Joan? I agree in everything that Joan has said, obviously. <laughs> and this last quote, okay, I have to, to write it down because it's really good. Uh, but yes, uh, I think the, taking the last question, because it involves the first so the, mark, the job market will be more accessible for everyone if in the education path is equal to them. Because when it comes to the job market opportunities, if we all receive the same education uh, level, things will be on the same path to, 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 to be included in the job market. So uh, like Joanna said, obviously university will have to do a big investment on creating uh, equal uh, opportunities. What we watched in these couple of months was that this, uh, there is still disadvantage. Uh, I'm, we'll have the Portuguese example. There are some colleagues that don't have a computer to, to, to be present on the online uh, classes and the, the university and the student union had to, to make some partnership to, to give them some computers. So it's possible to see that Although technology is present, still uh, a barrier to some people to have that at home. So the next step and the university cannot expect that tomorrow things will be everything not like it was on the past. It's going to, everything going to be on the same classes in the university building. No, things will occur also in the digital platform. So we must guarantee that all the students have a computer or a mobile device that allow them to, to still receive the information, uh, all the, the necessary material to be on the same level as the others. And if they guarantee that, uh, I think that's going to be more accessible the job market. But I think this university have to change the mindset and have to be prepared to uh, make an investment on digital uh, tools. 
Gotcha, thank you. Um, it's so wonderful to hear that there were some great examples, you know, even here in Portugal about um, uh, universities responding to the established disadvantage of certain students um, rapidly, uh, you know, in the middle of a semester. And perhaps this is somewhat of a test run for future um, such situations uh, in the future. So um, we've run out of time for session one. Thank you everyone for your participation in this first session on the academic job market and the future of European mobility in the uh, post COVID-19 era. Now I'll pass things over to Anna Klumpfer from ESU for the second session. Take it away, Anna. Well, um, hello everyone. Um, my name is Anna Klumpfer and I'm gonna be the, your moderator for the session number two. Um, and it's gonna be about distance learning and lessons learned from the COVID-19 crisis and what will the future bring. Um, I myself, I'm currently a master's student at the Technical University of Vienna and part of ESO, the European Students' Union. And I'm very happy to introduce our first, our first speaker, Nina de Winter. But first, I will, I will want to ask you all to go back to menti.com and use the new code, um, 88-3229, um, for, for posting questions for this session. So please refresh menti.com and enter the new code. Um, and yeah, now I'm very happy to introduce to you uh, Nina de Winter. Um, she's currently uh, a member of ESU's um, executive committee. Um, she holds a bachelor degree in international relations at the University of uh, Groningen in the Netherlands. And she's currently uh, working on Lesbos as a co coordinator for the NGO Yoga and Sports for Refugees. Uh, Nina has extensive experience in student representation, both on European level and on her in, on local level at her university. And I'm very happy to introduce her today as, your, as one of our speakers. She's gonna present um, on the theme of e-learning beyond COVID-19, lessons learned and recommendations. Please Nina, take it away. Thank you very much, uh, Anna. What a wonderful introduction. I'm gonna share with you my screen. Um, so you can all see my presentation. Um, yeah, so thank you, Anna. No introduction from my side needed anymore. I'm going to tell you in the next 10 minutes a little bit about uh, e-learning beyond COVID-19 and then especially our lessons learned and recommendations from, oh, now I need to click to the next one, from our uh, webinar series. So uh, I'm part of um, ESU's uh, executive committee. We are the European Students' Union, the umbrella organization for all the national student organizations in the different European countries. Um, and as soon as the whole COVID-19 situation started to develop and the implications for higher education also seems like quite extensive, um, we like as a executive committee together with the steering committee of our quality assurance student expert pool. That's a big pool of students where um, that we send to different reviews for quality, external quality assurance processes that who has a steering committee of which Anna is also one of the steering committee members. And together with this steering committee, um, as executive committee thought, okay, we have to organize a webinar series that's about e-learning since so many students do now have to switch from the traditional learning to online learning. And what, when we did this, we also really realized that, of course, e-learning is very different from doing traditional learning online. And that's also something that really, um, that, that really became clear throughout the webinar series. So I will elaborate a little bit on that uh, after. Um, but we thought, okay, so if we're going to do this webinar series, we're going to tackle multiple topics that are concerned that concern e-learning, but we also really, and the, the whole like to change in this COVID-19 times, but we also really want to look beyond that. And we want to see, okay, what can we learn from this time that we can really take with us to when we can all go to campus again and when life hopefully soon is all completely normal again, then we still of course want to take something from this time and we are also after this webinar series very convinced that that is definitely possible. Um, we had um, a lot of uh, experts in the four different webinars and 
in a wide, like a wide range in the field. So from the quality assurance side to the lifelong learning platform, uh, NUFIC about re recognition, the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities about their e excellence, the, their quality assurance uh, uh, framework, so to say, um, SURF, an organization from the Netherlands that works on the digitalization of higher education. So with um, many, many experts from the field and also always with uh, student experts. So that was also the setup of the webinar. It's basically a little bit like today. We did four webinars in which all of um, in with all with the same structure and we started with the presentations then did uh, elaborate discussion and took some uh, uh, conclusions from that. Um, why this whole introduction about the webinar series? Well basically because today we're going to talk about recommendations of course. Um, I want to start with our main conclusions. And they seem, maybe some seem a little bit obvious, but still I think they are super important. We cannot forget them and we should really, really mention. Um, the first main conclusion is communication is key. And of course, in times of COVID-19, this was super, super important. Because basically nobody knew what was going to happen and still nobody knows what is going to happen. So when we shifted from the traditional learning to the online learning, basically teachers were struggling with finding the ways institutions were struggling and students kind many mo yeah, mostly didn't really know what was going to what was going to happen to their studies, to their courses, to their degrees, to their internships, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So in every webinar, all the time, we talked a lot about communication. But taking this beyond COVID-19 is also that in an online learning setting, communication is very different and also much more difficult than when you're just opposite each other. And I think we really learn from also this kind of webinars. Like I'm looking at myself now and I don't know, it's still a little bit weird that I'm looking at myself when I'm talking in a, in a digital setting and don't have the interaction with the people like I have no clue how you're responding to my presentation at the moment like if you're laughing or if you're thinking like what the fuck is she talking about or yeah uh, this is obvious I, I mean I don't know because I just see myself so um, creating this kind of like communication um, and interaction line is something you really have to work on in an e-learning setting but it's still super important because creating this kind of like learning community and and having some meaningful interaction is super important also for e-learning and it's possible and i think we all kind of realize that we are getting better at it and that you can find ways to do it for example with like i don't know the hand clapping function or asking people to turn on their camera etc cetera, etc cetera. but it's things you have to think about so on the one hand it's communication about what's happening and what do you expect from learning and how do we um, organize the learning and that there's enough communication still between the teacher and the students about what's happening but on the other hand it's also changing your mindset about communication and how you work together um, then the second main conclusion, and that's also something I already touched upon, is that there's a fundamental difference between shifting traditional learning online and real e-learning. Because what we do now is an, a crisis response, and that's good. But when we think of e-learning, we also really have to think about like the didactics and the, pedag the pedagogy behind e-learning. And for example, this communication thing is an example on how um, how you have to take in things into account if you do real e-learning. So um, that means that students really need to be, students and teachers really need to be supported also to change their mindset towards real e-learning. Um, so it's a fundamental difference. Then that kind of like moves very smoothly towards our third conclusion, the support structures really need to be in place. And that's a, also something that's really lacking a little bit now in this COVID-19 situation. But for example, um, we had Laura Beston from the United, uh, from the UK in our first webinar, and they are working on e-learning already for a much longer time in their college. And what she says is that they're also, the student union is interacting a lot, a lot with the technical support staff. Um, 
just in order to make things work and to make it smoothly and for also the technical support to support the students and the teachers to understand e-learning, to make e-learning accessible and to make sure that everybody kind of like um, has the technical means and the technical knowledge to participate in e-learning. And that's also the fourth. Um, e-learning offers a lot of opportunities for people to join learning, to expand the number of people that can make, that can have access to higher education, but it can also limit people. If for example, they don't have access to internet or they don't have their own private room. Like for example, they are having a meeting now in my living room and I'm now in the bedroom, like sitting on some kind of like night, Table improvised thing and it's fine, but I don't know if I could make an exam here, so to say. So that's all things you really have to take into account that it should be super accessible. And of course, and my situation is super easy, like no worries, but there's a lot of people uh, that have many, much more problems, uh, of course, uh, with accessibility of e-learning. So that were the main conclusions. Um, but now a little bit, uh, further. For, I also wanted to kind of like quickly um, give you, make you reflect upon the fact that it's so fundamentally different from normal learning that I got the, um, um, the definition of e-learning from the presentation that was also given by one of the organizations um, in our webinar series. So just to kind of like get it and read it for yourself, e-learning is an innovative web-based system based on digital technologies and other forms of educational materials whose primary goal is to provide students with a personalized learner-centered, open, enjoyable, and interactive learning environment, supporting and enhancing the learning process. So basically how e-learning is more or less a tool to enhance the learning process. And all these terms are also terms that are super important to the European Students' Union and I think to all students. Like, if we do it and if we switch to e-learning, it should really contribute to making it more, to making it personalized, learner-centered, open, still enjoyable. I mean, it's also, I think a lot of people have experienced how, I don't know, kind of boring it is to be alone in your room and do online learning in your bed, maybe, <laughs> with, Instagram and another laptop with Netflix. I don't know, but like it's, so there's really a lot of things to take into account, but this is a starting point of the definition. Um, so when it comes to the implementation of e-learning, there are a lot of things that you have to take into account, which I already kind of like all mentioned, but when you're looking back at this presentation, I already want also really wanted to have them in bullet points in the presentation. So it's about, thinking about accessibility, about how you're gonna support staff and students, how also this process is co-creation, so how you can still involve your students in creating the learning, even if it's online. Um, and that means also a different role for like program committees, the student union, you really have to kind of like find a way to involve the students in the, in the creation process. Um, so, good communication and trying to find a way to build a community even though you're all behind your screen. Then when it comes to the assessment of online learning, well, that's also something that I think a lot of institutions learned a lot from in, uh, in these times. When it comes to assessment, we always say like, okay, but uh, then whoa, students are gonna cheat, they can look it up, you cannot control it. Um, so the most important lesson I think is to also be creative in how learning outcomes can be obtained. And that, that does not necessarily always have to be like a standardized test book, but it can be obtained in so many different ways. And we have to really move beyond the idea that students can only be tested by reproducing knowledge. And that's also a challenge for e-learning and a lesson learned I think is that we really have to rethink um, how we want students to obtain learning outcomes. And we also really have to like have built some kind of trust that students want to learn, that students um, have this intrinsic motivation to study somehow, but that just really means that you have to rethink assessments. 
And that's a challenge, but also a big opportunity about e-learning and about moving beyond COVID-19 times. So then when it comes also to assessment and um, a thing that students brought up a lot that worried, uh, that was really worrisome to them was their security and privacy of like their data and with proctoring that you have to show like your room and everything like that was really something that a lot of students find found very difficult. So kind of what we concluded from our webinar series is also that if a student really has problems with an online proctoring exam that there should always be an alternative. Um, and of course, also when it comes to assessment, there should also always be a guarantee for if you're if you feel if you have like technical issues or another kind of obstacle that makes that you cannot access the exam. Um, but the key word here really for the future is trust and rethinking how to obtain um, learning outcomes. Then when it comes to the quality assurance, um, when it comes to quality assurance of e-learning, we have to conclude that the ESGs, like the European Standards and Guidelines for Quality Assurance, that's the framework in which uh, programs have to be assessed now from like the European perspective. Um, I'm not going to go too much into detail about it, but let's say like the, the framework on how we make sure that the quality of the programs is, uh, is good. They are flexible enough for e-learning. So basically we don't need to make a lot of new things or new frameworks um, in order for it to be able to really quality assured online programs. But there's a lot of things we do have to take into account. And that's basically also the things that I mentioned under communication. Like you have to take another mindset if you're gonna do the quality assurance of e-learning and you have to have a different focus. And that really concerns like the, that there's like different elements in e-learning that you have to pay attention to. So how can students still participate? How can students still give their feedback and how is that taken into account? How is the community building working in e-learning? How are the support structures formalized? Um, but the main conclusion from this webinar was actually, okay, but the frameworks are there and it also offers a lot of opportunity to um, offer more short cycle education. And that's also where we come a little bit to the recognition of e-learning. It's of course very important that if you do a program that you get it recognized. And um, currently, there's a lot of education providers providing a little, like all kinds of courses online. But you want to make sure that if you do this from the higher education perspective, that also the outside world sees this as something, okay, this is provided by a higher education institution. This is the same as going to the university and studying there. And for a formal program, three years, etc., there's frameworks and it's possible. But the challenge comes especially when it comes to short cycle education. So MOOCs and um, separate courses, etc., etc. And currently it's quite difficult to get it recognized. Um, as long as it is within a program, it's not so much a problem. But as soon as it is something separate, it's difficult. And here also is where quality assurance really comes into, into the picture, because basically what, what is the challenge for e-learning beyond uh, COVID-19 is that we get these small elements also recognized and quality assured. So that the quality assurance agencies have a possibility to kind of like approve it and say, this is a good MOOC or a good short cycle, like a, a good short program. Um, we can recognize this and together we can see this um, as <laughs> we can see this as something um, valuable from a higher education institution. So um, that's a challenge for the future, but definitely also a great, great opportunity. And here again, it also comes a lot of trust. So that's what I wanted to tell you a little bit about the um, e-learning recommendations and uh, challenges and opportunities beyond COVID-19. Thank you. And I think I'll give the floor back to uh, Anna. 
Yes, thank you very much, Nina. Thank you for, for this very quick and um, broad overview over the theme of distance learning. Um, I would like to remind you to please post your questions via menti.com. The code is both on the slides and uh, in the chat. And now I'm very happy to introduce to you our next speaker, Eduardo Freitas, um, who is studying electrical and computer engineering at the Nova School of Science and Technology. And he's also a member of the Students' Union um, there. And he will be presenting to us um, about digital learning difficulties and opportunities. Please take it away, Eduardo. Hi, thank you, Anna. So I'll be sharing my screen now. Um, so about the presentations that are already been presented today, it's uh, really interesting that uh, a lot of points uh, will be in common. And this only proves that uh, all the, the challenges we faced in the past months with the digital learning uh, are common throughout uh, several countries. And uh, these kind of international initiatives like uh, Unica is doing, it's really good to exchange uh, the, our points of view and learn and uh, um, uh, resolve all the difficulties we'll, we're facing. And uh, today I'll be giving a bit of my perspective as a student who face all the challenges um, of digital learning and I'll be focusing more on the difficulties and opportunities we all probably face. So the first thing I noticed when the news of distance learning started uh, was that no one was prepared really. It was uh, something that we, not, we, we never thought that could happen. And in less than a week, students and teachers and faculty staff uh, had to end the, change their routines and start new ones. And because there was really no preparation, we all had to adapt to the challenge of online classes and digital learning. And uh, without knowing what will happen in the next month, all this was happening with an increasing global pandemic. Uh, so right from this very start, we can infer that the digital learning we lived in the past month does not really reflect what it will be in a normal situation. Um, but nevertheless, there's a lot we can take from this experience, either it was uh, good things or bad things. Um, starting with uh, uh, difficulties, the first immediate challenge that uh, probably only some students faced was how the nature of our courses would allow uh, digital learning to work. For example, students from fine arts, uh, theater, dance, probably had way more difficulties with digital learning than students from uh, sciences or engineering. Uh, I'm from an engineering field, so I'm lucky to say that I could do almost everything that was planned in the beginning of the semester. Uh, and the next challenge that's also been referred uh, is the internet connection. From teachers to students, internet was mandatory for this type of digital learning. And this was an even bigger problem for people who relied on the internet and the computers available on campus. Um, so this exposed some of the social and economic limitations of digital learning. Uh, should this mean that uh, students and teachers are demanded to have internet connections at home or computers? So uh, for the success, 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 sorry, success of digital learning, uh, and furthering this topic, uh, we have students from the countryside or students from more remote areas whose internet connections are less stable. So could this in some way um, indicate that students from the city are in, in somewhat ad advantage? Um, then we have what happened in our daily routines. I dare to say that uh, most students had their classes in their bedrooms. Uh, so which was also their workspace for studying after classes. And perhaps it was also the, the place for leisure, maybe watching Netflix or playing games. And without noticing, we spent uh, days in our rooms um, and our brain could mix the resting time with the working time. Uh, something that uh, also many students have referred is that uh, in with this situation, we ended up working way more hours than usual, but that didn't mean that those hours were being as productive. So to avoid this scenario, maybe the best alternative would be to have a separate room for working. So could this mean that 
our mental health and our success in digital learning will depend in the in the conditions we have at home. Um, uh, as uh, like Nina referred, another topic that's been widely discussed is the data security. With uh, digital learning, we have um, a bigger presence on the internet, and our pres our personal data is always involved in some way. So this is a concern shared by many students. Uh, I believe in this semester, this was a bigger issue because uh, since things were so rushed, um, all the platforms we use were mainly not governmental. So perhaps in the future, the situation could be corrected through in, in that way. Uh, and then we have all the challenges we faced with teaching and assessment challenges both shared by teachers and uh, teachers and students. Uh, online classes means hours and hours looking at the screen and um, whether it's live classes or recorded videos. And uh, this routine during a whole semester might get tiresome after a while. Uh, also, there's the question of the quality of and productivity of these classes. There are several points of view on this matter because some people might say it's easier to get distracted and other in the, might add that um, um, the lack of human presence might disturb the learning experience. And then with the assessment, one of the main concerns that's been also referred is the, um, the obsession um, the, the obsession uh, with the cheating and fraud. Um, this, uh, this obsession led to changes in the, um, the assessment that ended up creating some constraints, like reducing the time of the tests or increasing the difficulty of the evaluation methods. Uh, in my experience, I admit it was not easy uh, doing tests that wouldn't really allow you to think. And maybe reviewing a question could mean that you wouldn't have enough time to finish that same test. Uh, and maybe I'm just bad at it, but uh, being able to check my textbooks did not really help having a better grade. Um, this fear uh, of cheating or the need for it exposed some of the fragilities in our educational systems. If a student is so concerned in passing a test or having a better grade, and teachers are so afraid of this dishonesty, maybe this reflects on how the priority is not in learning, but in passing or having a better average. Maybe it means that the models uh, currently used are not up to date with the reality of our generations, or for example, the needs of the job market. But None of this is really linear and uh, we all lived many different um, experiences. But what opportunities did this past month brought to our perception of digital learning? Uh, the first point, in my opinion, would be that this is actually possible. Uh, before the pandemic, I never really thought about uh, the possibility of introducing this way of digital learning in a regular course. Uh, there are also a lot of perks that would come with the digital learning. Um, for example, these online classes could spare hours and hours and hours of commuting for many students, which was noticeable this semester since online, most of the classes had way more students than usual since transports were not an obstacle. Also, recorded videos, for example, uh, allowed us to watch the videos whenever we want. We could pause, we could rewind, we could replay and review them later. So this was also uh, a really interesting perk that we usually don't have in a normal um, uh, system. And uh, as I uh, referred, um, a lot of the difficulties we lived exposed some of the social and economic uh, inequalities and uh, uh, fragilities in the, the teaching uh, system. Uh, so we can take from this experience uh, a need to change and an opportunity for such, since probably the next semester we'll still need several precautions due to the virus. Uh, we can try now a digital, a prepared digital learning and not a rushed one. Um, 
as also referred by João and Joana, um, this, this experience uh, opened doors for the use of digital learning tools. Uh, while perhaps a complete digital learning is not possible, th truth is that a lot of learning can be done at home in an autonomous way. Um, and it shouldn't be too naive to start including tools that use machine learning or artificial intelligence in our um, ways of learning. To conclude, we're, to conclude, in conclusion, we are entering a new decade with more technology and access to more advanced tools than ever. And even though this pandemic was tragic worldwide, uh, we should use the momentum to change, to innovate and recreate our ways of learning. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Um, thank you for your insights on, on distance learning. And I already see we have a lot of questions in Menti. So I would ask you all to also use our, the um, upvote um, method in Menti to, um, to upvote the questions you're most interested in because um, it will be a challenge to answer them all after, after all of our presentations. Um, I'm very happy to introduce our next presenter, uh, Padia Bagheri. Um, Padia is the vice president of the International Young Nature Friends, um, which is one of the biggest European environmentalist NGOs. Um, and Padia is studying design um, at the University of Florence. She will, uh, her presentation will be about non-formal education, a possibility for online education. So Padi, please take it away. Thank you so much, Anna. So hi, everyone. Um, I would like to introduce you non-formal education. It's a possibility for online education, and we are going to go through why does it matter. So I would like to start with a short intro for people who doesn't know what a non-formal education is. It's basically education that is practical and vocational education outside the school system. Now, um, we know non-formal education with different names. For example, it's interchangeable by terms such as community education, um, adult education, life life lifelong education, and second chance education. So basically, um, let's say the, the modern um, uh, existing definition of non-formal learning is uh, purposive learning, diverse context, or alternative or complementary teaching and learning styles, and less developed um, recognition of outcomes of quality. So this is a good point that we don't mark or grade anything. So you might come up with a question that what is actually the, dif the, the difference between non-formal education and informal education? Is there a difference? That is a yes. So basically non-formal education is what happened without a really specific plan. For example, when uh, children teach their kids how to bike, um, ride a bike. But now formal education is a long, um, long programming of a specific value or um, mission to be accomplished through non formal education. Now, <clears throat> the million dollar question, how will we communicate in the future? So um, we don't know the answer to that question specifically. I don't think um, anyone came up with 100% uh, of correctness of an answer. But we might say that there might be the traces of non-formal education in the future learning because um, non-formal education is in line with European values. So European values are um, in line with normal non-formal education's core ideologies and patterns. Now let's go back to the history. Uh, in 1998, the European minister um, declared that non-formal education can be the priority working area of Council of Europe's youth field, considering non-formal education as a mean of integration into society. Um, I provided you with a really synthetic, um, let's say, um, European value list. It's basically, well, we all know that the European common uh, countries, um, they prevail in the society in which inclusion, tolerance, um, justice, solidarity, and non-discrimination happens. So basically values are um, in, um, European values uh, in the way of living is human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, and human rights. So um, why am I talking about European values? Um, it's because in non-formal education is quite in line with uh, European values. For example, um, the essential features of non-formal learning can be the balance of coexistence and integration between cognitive, 
effective and practical dimension of learning. It can be also a close to real life and concerns, experimental and oriented by learning by doing, intercultural exchanges and encounters as learning devices. It is definitely voluntarily and ideally open, open access and it aims above all to convey and, uh, and practice the values and the skills of democratic life. So the fun part. Um, we were honored with IYNF to um, launch a two month seminar and because we are 100% um, always doing trainings and um, courses on, uh, with non-formal education method, um, we came up with, with the question, so how can we make it online? Because non-formal is very interactive. So the pandemic kind of helped us to come up with new ideas for online tools. Now, I don't know if you're um, concerned with team building uh, in the classrooms, but this can be one of the things that can be integrated into universities and classes. Because um, let's face it, one of the, one of the tra tragedies of e-learning is um, the lack of community building, as the other speakers mentioned. So basically, um, we don't have enough time for coffee breaks, for people to talk to each other. Uh, there is no transportation time to say, okay, I'm going to take that bus back home and let's, let's have a talk or uh, you're not motivated. Uh, you don't feel like part of the part of the class and part of the university environment. No. So for, um, let's say, um, helping to boost the beginning of the classes, it is um, recommended for teachers or trainers to um, ask um, open questions from the whole class. So in every individual. For example, your favorite music track, or would you, if, if you would have want to have a chat with someone on this planet, who would it be, die, dead or alive? Or what do you see out of the window of your room, or your favorite animal verse? These are the things that people um, can share. Obviously, it's not as good as being present in a classroom, but it might kind of give them the idea that I'm getting to know who is behind the, the video call that is just staring at me. Um, one of the most effective tools that we experienced was the quizzes online instead of slide presentations. So for example, I want to ask a question. Um, I, I, I want to um, explain a, let's say, uh, an argument or a statement. I put it on Kahoot, that's it. I think it's also, I'm sure it's in, in English. I'm not sure if it's IT. I think it has different versions. But anyway, um, so um, I put it online and people of my classroom can um, answer the question like a quiz and then they are being rated. So it's also a bit competitive. So it makes people to not lose motivation to stay focused. And then when the, the quiz is like the question is closed, you can explain like a slide presentation, but it really helps to, to keep the di um, dynamic of the conversation up. Um, now, that was, let's say, energizers and um, icebreaker games. Uh, it was really challenging because energizers and icebreakers are usually like the, the concept of non-formal education that uh, involve physical activity. Uh, for people who doesn't know, energizers are mostly, let's say, tools to make people um, stay focused or uh, if they're tired or sleepy or yawning uh, you know a bit of physical activity would make them um, come back to concentrate um, among the best that we have experienced was playing music at the beginning of the class or after the coffee break and it was only one track of music we were not changing it so people in the end of the course and uh, they told us that even after the course they were listening to that track to stay motivated to do their homeworks so that was that would really work. And by the end of the music, everyone knew that the session will be starting. Um, um, physical activity energizers, for example, um, to make people move in their living rooms or houses, um, go touch something blue, go, go touch um, a glass, um, go touch something soft or anything. It can be anything. And they could pass the ball. So each, each one that was the last one to touch something that was indicated they would be the one to declare what's the next one. So it's also making it interactive. Sing a song and dance together, but it depends. I don't know how many of um, you have like very alternative, let's say informal classrooms, but it really works. And like, for example, making um, sessions with small groups online, for example, breakout rooms, 
and play games like deserted island game that you explain like put you put people in a position that they have to make decisions and um, choose elements to pick up to bring on the deserted island um, Online whiteboards and stickers. So padlet.com, ideasboard.io are, let's say, offering free tools for collaboration groups. It's really effective for a classroom who want to kind of have a whiteboard and like they're um, asking for brainstorming. And um, this is really interactive. You can also share the, the screen and then all the stickers um, start disappearing, which is really int uh, intuitive. Opinion barometer, this is my favorite tool. It's basically um, you draw a line with two ends in the whiteboard and ask the participant a question or give them a quote or an argument. And the participants should then take a position in the question or the statement. This can be followed by discussion. For example, there's a line on Zoom. And um, so left is yes, right is no, or left is agree, right is disagree, or it can, it can be anything. And then people can pick a position that they, they can be really close to the line, they can be really close to the no or yes. And then you leave the floor to the students to actually discuss why they have chosen that, um, um, that uh, position for themselves. So it's kind of, um, this is like the core of non-formal education. You let people reach to the point uh, of their understanding. And then the professor or the trainer just can um, follow the discussion and give them some indication to go to the right direction. Other education sources, it can be used videos, role plays, pictures, other materials to enrich discussions and give impulses to participants. You can be creative as much as you want and gamification is the main core of um, non-formal education. Now, um, Dickens said electric communication will never be a substitute for the face of someone who, uh, with who their soul encourages another person to be brave and true. But we as IYNF, um, we would quote that by saying, but let's try to make it as effective as possible as much as we can. Thank you so much. I will give the floor back to Anna. Thank you very much, Patti. Um, thank you for your insights and all, all of the learnings that you had. Um, I will now share my screen with all of your questions. Um, I would again ask you to also use the um, upvote uh, method in, um, in Menti because we're already quite, uh, quite tight on time and we will, we will not be able to answer all questions. So please just upvote the questions that you're most interested in and we're gonna answer those with the panelists. So then let's jump right in. Um, our first question. Um, to our panelists. Um, as students, um, do you think digital learning could be included in a normal semester post-COVID? Who wants to answer that one? Yes, yes. Um, uh, my answer is uh, immediately, obviously, yes. Um, uh, at least in, in my faculty, we have uh, uh, kind of like three types of quests, more theoretical ones, more practical ones. Um, I believe uh, mainly the theoretical ones that um, uh, exposing uh, theory uh, could be those could be immediately digital because uh, there's not an uh, immediate immediate need for interaction. Um, so yeah, uh, like we had through Zoom through Zoom or recorded uh, classes. Um, so this was uh, a small implementation that uh, not only could uh, spare a lot of, um, I I'm saying trouble, but uh, it's not as a bad thing. Like I referred commuting for many students that have to wake up very early, but also for teachers and even resources of the faculty itself, not because of the classes they would have uh, for those uh, classes that wouldn't be needed. Um, so yes, my answer is yes, this is a, an example. Uh, and uh, I could go further, uh, sharing an opinion that uh, a teacher of mine uh, referred um, that I found really interesting. Uh, like I said in my presentation about uh, machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, uh, designing tools that we could use uh, at home, uh, something very simple like a random um, quiz generator that uh, you would answer and you would be practicing at home and you would be learning. Um, and that quiz could 
uh, focus more on the questions where you have more trouble and um, uh, provide more on the topics you you are uh, less comfortable with um, making you learn more about that part and uh, this it's really simple it's all it, it already exists and could be easily inserted in the normal semester thank you very much um, thank you for this um, yes I I think it will be a great opportunity to use certain aspects and use it during a normal semester as well, because it has a lot of positive things. Um, the next question, um, what could be improved from the side of the teachers for distance learning? Is anybody, is, is somebody interested in answering that? I think I can maybe talk a little bit about that since we also included the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities and from the side of the teachers, what they highlighted all the time was like that teachers really need to be supported because it's a complete change in mindset and a shift in how you communicate with your students, what you expect from your students, um, how you make sure that you can still offer them a personal approach. That was also one of the questions that I saw further in the, in the question list, like how do you still make sure that you know who is on the other side of the screen and that you can make kind of an estimation on how this person should be supported so i think there's a lot of things that teachers kind of like need to know and learn before they can teach uh, distance learning so if you say like what can be improved then i would just generally say like the support structures teachers really should be offered time and resources to learn how to teach distance learning Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think that also covers a little bit what, what Patti said in her presentation where she, where she showed us so many tools and uh, methods we could teachers could use to make uh, online teaching more interactive. So thank you very much. Um, let's go on to our next question. That is, um, well, some personality types have more difficulties in adapting to this digital environment how can we personalize this digital learning experience in order to include them too? Um, Patti, would you be interested in answering this question? Um, 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 we had this tool that is called Needs and Wishes. So basically at the beginning of uh, a seminar or a classroom, you can uh, provide a um, like an um, um, open source um, file so they can express what they really need. And it can be anything. Might be I need a lot of coffee breaks. I need I need to be capable of drink or eat while listening, or um, I need to turn off my video because I don't have good internet connection. So um, while giving the giving them the opportunity to talk about their needs, then you give them the opportunity to tell the, tell you about wishes. And one of the interesting thing was like once we, uh, we occurred this uh, person who asked us for respect to their privacy. And so then we started um, like making the, the questionnaire that if we can uh, make the recording or if we do the, make the recording, where are we going to use it? So um, it was really intuitive and everyone really shared a lot of things. And I think uh, it's really important to give them space to at the beginning, not during, or if we see that something is not working actually, then in the, in the middle of the class is also possible, but to talk about needs and wishes. And I think also just to add to that, here is also a big responsibility for the teachers. Like for the teachers, this is so difficult. And this is also something we really have to like, this is why you have such a different pedagogical approach when you are teaching in a distance environment. And then indeed using this kind of tools gives the teacher an indication of how to like behave. And then it's really upon the teacher to try to like build in flexibility or to kind of like ask that student a little bit more or let that student do a little bit more his own thing. So I also wouldn't, necessarily say that it's easier to teach uh, just to give a presentation on distance learning like if you really do distance learning you really have to develop your pedagogical skills for that well thank you very much um let's go on to our next question oh <laughs> 
Our next question. Um, well, should students' evaluation change since te teaching methods are changing? Um, maybe Nina, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I already said that, of course, also in my presentation, like completely. But I think generally, like speaking from my position in the European Students Union, but also from me as a person, I think we should completely rethink how we evaluate, um, um, like the, the how how we students evaluation. Like we should completely rethink the concept on um, um, on how we're expecting students to show that they obtain the learning outcomes. Yeah, I can add that. Um... I think the whole um, evaluation at the end of the term is not going to work in, um, in so many aspects as um, Eduardo mentioned. Uh, and I think it should be more process oriented and giving value based on the process and um, the, the, the projects that can be done during or participation that can be done during the, the course. Thank you very much. Eduardo, do you want to um, also share your experience um, during the last semester with uh, student evaluations? Yes, um, I can say that uh, I'm really lucky actually because not only I'm from uh, a field where we deal with a lot of technology, mainly computers stuff, so it was easy to change for uh, distance learning and also um, the teachers I work with are also uh, in um, um, very comfortable with the technologies. Um, so I, I was looking at that aspect and we were all able to adapt and um, mo modify the evaluation um, objectives, allowing students to learn uh, and still uh, uh, maintaining the, the, learn the evaluation uh, system. But um, in other courses, uh, this, is, this did, didn't happen. And uh, obviously the evaluation should be completely different uh, compared to what, uh, what usually was. And even in a normal semester, the evaluation itself should be different. Uh, which should, there should be, in my opinion, more of a conversation and a debate and uh, uh, discussing the themes um, rather than only doing a test. Okay, you, had a, you are positive, you, you are good to go. No, that really needs um, some changes in either, either digital or uh, normal situation. Thank you for all your insights. Um, now we can go on to our, our next question. Um, do you think we already have the right tools for online learning? And um, what can we already improve? Um, um, yeah. <laughs> you want to say something, Eduardo? Uh, if you want to, you can say. <laughs> um, um, there, there was this discussion about a platform that actually allows um, to use different tools at the same time. Because one of the critics to online education right now is that uh, the, the, the trainers, the professors, they need to use so many different platforms. They're on Zoom and then they have to go to the e-learning platform of the university and then they have to go to Google Drive and uh, from there for chatting with the student, they have to go back to another chat room, maybe in WhatsApp. So one of the proposals might be for developers to, to actually come up with the idea for a platform that can have everything in the same place so then it would be easier to interact with each other in the same time yeah sharing uh, the only thing i was going to add is that uh, uh, the example i gave with the quiz that would learn our difficulties uh, in portugal for example um, that's already used in sites uh, for the um, the driving lesson exam, um, which is really interesting, uh, something so simple. I pro it's probably amateur uh, and it already exists. So it could be uh, immediately implemented in uh, uh, learning. Well, thank you very much. Um, 
I also had the experience as a student that we have a lot of tools and sometimes it's hard to know which teacher likes to communicate over which tool. So thank you for your insights. Um, let's go on to the next question. Um, do you think online programs will be subsidized more by universities, long-term speaking, e.g. office packages or Zoom premium? What are your opinions on this? Uh, this depends a lot um, of, of the decisions that uh, uh, it's, um, it's not, um, I don't want to say it's not up to students because obviously students input should always uh, matter in these uh, subjects, uh, but uh, that will probably have to come from um, the, the faculty uh, board um, in in all uh, matters that regard money eventually. Uh, but yes, I think that uh, um, it, uh, it should be um, implicit that uh, if we are using these tools, that uh, we should have the best uh, version and opportunity from those tools. Um, and I'm not sure if uh, when changing some aspects to digital learning, maybe some resources that were being used um, in the normal um, in our normal semester could be now direction to uh, these parts of digital learning and still keeping a quality uh, experience. But my uh, experience is um, on the institutional level, but now also on the European level, is that they are dedicating more and more research towards digital initiatives. Like now with the micro-credentials initiative on the European Commission level, and also in my institution, that they were creating like budgets for digital infrastructure. So it, there's really, really a move towards investing in, um, in online programs. Well, thank you very much. Um, in my opinion as well, and maybe this whole crisis also leads to further development of open source solutions where everybody can continue developing these things together. So let's go on to our next question. Question for Faria. Um, most of the method, most of those methods just work with small groups. What would you suggest for larger groups, 25 plus participants? Um, so basically when it, uh, it's about groups more than 25, we definitely divide them to a small group. So if the course will take four months, we will do it one month each and intensive. So um, because usually non-formal education cannot um, go over than 35 participants because it won't have the same impact because it's about um, it's about uh, divergence, about uh, getting together and experience what you have to learn. So um, I don't recommend, and I have never seen non-formal education working on larger groups. And in university, in, uh, in one university, I've already seen that they're dividing into small groups, which creates a lot of problems, obviously, because then the end of the semester is not end of the semester. And um, so there's a lot of debate on it, but from my point of view, um, it won't be as effective as it could be if the group is small. Thank you very much. Um, I'll have to have to look, a look at the time and we're already pretty short. So I guess this will be our last question to our panelists. So um, should online learning impact national decisions relating to student fees? What are your opinions on this? Maybe Nina from the European perspective first. Mm, well, from the perspective of ESO, I would say uh, students should always be studying for free. Student fees shouldn't be there. So this is a difficult question <laughs> to answer for me, but I would say online learning should have the same quality and there should be even maybe even more resources dedicated to it and teachers should be supported a lot to do this well so i wouldn't say that it's it's like cheaper or something i think that's completely the wrong kind of mindset that online learning is cheaper but i would just say 
everybody should have access to higher education. And then it doesn't matter if you're a refugee here in Moria camp or if you are um, very rich kids from somewhere else in Europe. If you have the brains and the knowledge to study, you should be able to study. I'm quite happy I can end my, uh, my presentation with these words, actually. But that's my opinion on this. Well, thank you very much, Eduardo Padi, for your opinions. Uh, I completely agree with the concept that everyone should have the opportunity to study and the money should not be at all uh, the first constraint in many cases. Um, about um, the impact of distance lear on online learning with uh, fees. Uh, uh, it, I, I agree when Nina said that um, if online learning is cheaper, uh, that we shouldn't see it that way. But even so, if there's any relevance, um, that should never uh, increase the student fee if um, uh, it um, ends up uh, showing that uh, the faculty will save money. And that said money should be all dedicated to improving uh, the quality uh, of teaching. If uh, we're talking about money, the student's fee should never increase, in my opinion, and al always decrease in direction of a uh, um, free for all. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't have something special to add, but just, um, for example, one of the, the things that would occur during pandemic was that the professors were working more hours than less hours. So uh, without the proper regulation to it, I cannot answer that question. Plus, um, maybe we can say, okay, the expenses that the universities or the in institutions having by being shut down is really um, um, decreased. For example, the um, uh, utensils of the faculties or maintenance and um, so maybe they can put that um, resource into some online tools to buy it for students or different uh, possibilities new possibilities for students um, more than that i don't have much to, to add yeah well thank you very much thank you very much to all of you for your presentations, for your answers to the questions, and thank you also to you, you participants for all of these interesting questions, which we could not, which would we, which we could not answer all. I'm sorry about that. Um, I am happy to uh, to uh, hand over to a moderate to our moderator for session three, Patti, who you already know. Um, so have fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Anna. So um, welcome to the third session um, of this um, seminar. It's about the, the third session of the conversation is about the future of the social impact of universities and how the crisis has affected its perception. I would like to uh, mention that the new code for Mentimeter is going to be sent right now in the chat. It's 553739. Uh, we would be looking forward to see your comments um, and uh, insights or your questions. Um, so we are honored to have two uh, speakers for this session. The first one is Helen Marina Mariot. I'm sorry. Helen is currently a member of the Ex Executive Committee of ESU for the mandate of 2019-20. Uh, Previously, she was the Equality Coordinator for the European Students' Union. Before that, she was involved in the National Students' Union for the French-speaking community in Belgium for four years, holding positions at different levels of the organization. She is currently finishing her master's degree in cultural management in Brussels. At ESU, she focuses mainly on the social dimensions and quality of higher education, including the areas such as accessibility to higher education, student housing, student transport, um, social inclusion, and inclusive mobility. The title of her uh, presentation will be the social impact of universities after the COVID-19 crisis. So um, Helen, um, if you're ready, floor is yours. Hello everybody. Uh, thank you for inviting me on behalf of ESU for, for this presentation. Uh, I'm going to, to share my screen and, and start the, the presentation. So as Paria uh, mentioned, the presentation I'm going to, to do today uh, is about the social impact of universities, especially after the COVID-19 uh, crisis. But for a start, 
uh, I'd like to uh, have a few words uh, about the social impact in general of universities and the, and the social role of universities uh, also outside of the pandemic situation. Uh, in ESO, one of our main positions is that higher education and education in general is a uh, public good, meaning that higher education uh, should not be considered only as a mere commodity. Um, so it means that higher education should be accessible to all that can participate in it, that has the capacity to participate in it. It should be inclusive, meaning that no um, group of students or, or uh, citizens need, must be um, excluded of it, it should be accessible with proper mechanism and reflective of the diversity of the society, which is unfortunately uh, still not uh, exactly the case everywhere across Europe at the moment. Um, the ESU thinks that high, higher education institutions, so including universities, are one of the most important mechanism to steer our way through social, cultural, economic changes in our societies. So to give a few words about uh, what I mentioned before about inclusiveness. So university should be a place where everyone can have equal opportunities. So it's about who can access, but also who can complete their courses. Because we mention uh, often a lot accessibility uh, to higher education, but it's uh, retention measures are equally important to, to, to have uh, universities that offer equal opportunities. And it's the, the responsibility of institutions themselves to have in place a uh, support mechanism for students, but also of higher education systems and government uh, with measures such as uh, grants, for instance, and, and housing. And unfortunately, at the moment, the situation is such that many barriers still exist for students um, and that the access to higher education is still not equal. Meaning that um, more than often, unfortunately, universities remain um, something that is made by more privileged people for more privileged students. And in 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 the sense of uh, in, the re in in this regard, like how to make education more uh, inclusive and more accessible, something that is very important and that we are working a lot on uh, in ESU is the student support systems. So student support systems can, of course, be uh, grants that are given by the government or by universities or other institutions, but they can also be something that is more, let's say, material. So facilitated accessibility to, to housing, for instance, counseling, uh, mental health support, um, curricula counseling, career counseling, etc. Um, and those student support systems are key to making um, university more inclusive and, and help them fulfill their social role and social uh, impact. And of course, the benefit for, for university, I think at large, uh, is that the, the, the more diverse the student body is and the more diverse the student population is, uh, the more diversity in the long term or um, let's say mid term, uh, the more the diversity in academia itself um, will increase. And this is also going to be a benefit for uh, research as well, meaning that the, the for instance, the research, the research topic will, will be more diverse and tackle um, uh, experiences that maybe were not tackled uh, before when the population was less diverse. But now let's concentrate on the new challenges that were raised uh, by the COVID-19 crisis. So the thing is, the, the pandemic shows that um, some challenge like showcase pre-existing and new challenges. Um, the fact, uh, the, the, the past few months that we have lived through, um, of course, have shown um, uh, new issues. For instance, um, the access to some resources, I will come back to that uh, afterwards, but some things were already pre-existing. For instance, the fact that many universities across Europe, unfortunately, do not have at the moment, proper solution for uh, blended learning, so mixing digital and physical higher education. Uh, it's the same for mobility programs uh, for blended mobility, so digital uh, tools, but also physical mobility. Uh, the access to resources. Of course, before the pandemic, some students still didn't have enough uh, access to some resources, so classes material, but also the proper tools. Uh, but the fact that uh, classes were given remotely uh, during the past month has showcased that even more. And this is the same for student support systems. 
it showcases the fact that there is uh, in, in many countries and many universities a lack um, in efficiency in student support systems. As an example, uh, what we worked on in ESU um, during the pandemic and what we noticed is that housing remained uh, quite an issue for students. In, in, in many countries, uh, students who were um, in student dorms, for instance, uh, managed by the university or by, uh, by higher education ministries, faced some issues. Sometimes they, couldn't, uh, they could not stay in there uh, during the lockdown, for instance. And the issue was even uh, more uh, concerning for mobile students, so students who were abroad at the beginning of the lockdown period. Some of them, at some point, found themselves without any kind of solution to go back home and also uh, difficult situations in the dorms that they were uh, staying at. Maybe because the internet connection was not good, because maybe they didn't have access to libraries or to any kind of tools to follow their classes and complete them. So that shows um, a problem in the student support systems when it comes to housing. The same problem uh, was a bit showcased on the accessibility to grants. So in general, it's, um, it's an issue that is very essential, that students need to access to grants to be able to sustain themselves during their studies. Um, and this is also something that had to be guaranteed during the, the lockdown period and was not always guaranteed, depending on, on the country. Something that is also very concerning, I mentioned it before, is the access to learning resources. Uh, the tools and the material. Because higher education was highly uh, digitalized during the past few months, um, inequalities in the, among the students were, um, were growing bigger in a way. Over the past months, uh, the, the past few months, Ezu has um, led a survey with the University of Zagreb, the Ministry of Higher Education in Croatia, and the Institute for Development of Education of Croatia as well, uh, to try to um, to quantify and to gather the experiences of students during the pandemic. And what we uh, have uh, seen in the results um, is that about 10% of the respondents, so it's more than 10,000 respondents that we had, 10% uh, of them didn't always have access to a computer, uh, which is obviously problematic when all of your classes are online. Um, 60% of them did not always have access to a good internet connection uh, that is good enough to follow the classes. So some of them had sometimes access, but overall only 40% always had this guaranteed access. Um, this is the same uh, statistics more or less for students who did not always have a quiet place to study and to be able to follow their classes. So those are uh, some numbers uh, to, to show that we take for granted that young people now uh, have access to digital tools, have a, know how to use them, and that it's very easy for, for all of us to, to follow classes online. Well, in fact, it's not, and it's quite concerning. And obviously, um, the students who do not have access to a good internet connection, to an efficient computer, are always the less privileged. And the ones who already were uh, facing a lot of barriers to access higher education, so for us, that's one of the, of the main um, points of concern of what this uh, pandemic and the lockdowns have brought. And it's also um, the responsibility of the, of the universities and the higher education systems to provide students with uh, efficient solutions uh, in this regard. So as I was saying, uh, because there was an increase uh, in the use of digital tools, there's also a concern that we have. We had before, obviously, when mentioning digitalization of higher education, but now it's something that is becoming quite urgent. It's about the security of students uh, and of their uh, data and their privacy online. We have seen in, in, in many countries um, new softwares being used and tested by universities to pass exams, to give classes, etc. And sometimes the software were really intrusive and students didn't have any kind of choice um, uh, about whether to use them or not for, for, their, uh, for their exams. And that's something that is a point of attention that we would like to, to raise. There should be uh, safe alternatives and students need to be able to have the full grasp on their uh, online privacy and their data. And that's also something that universities should concentrate on to, to have 
um, a larger inclusivity of all and give the opportunity to all to participate fully. Um, the, the pandemic period also showed uh, new needs. So uh, as we do not know if we are going to, go th to have to go through uh, more log lockdowns in the future and in the optic that maybe higher education is going to become more and more blended in any case with uh, physical uh, classes and also digital, um, digital the, the use of digital tools we need to to find new ways of making support systems more uh, efficient in relation to this so we can think maybe of material support um, to guarantee in student dorms a good internet connection, which is not the case uh, in many places at the moment. Uh, maybe making available uh, digital tools, computers um, that are needed for students who actually need them and do not have access. Otherwise, it will, the risk is that it's going to create um, even more two speeds in higher education. Those who have the financial means to actually have all the material and all the tools uh, that they need and those who actually have the capacity to study but cannot because they, they cannot afford it, they cannot afford the material. Um, and the, the, the risk is that the barriers that are already there are going to be even worse and still for the same group of students as before. I think also in the, in the optic that um, higher education is going to become more and more uh, blended and, and, and in the future of university, uh, institutions have a responsibility to integrate the, the issue of sustainability in the transition, to find ways uh, of making their way of functioning and um, providing classes doing research more sustainable and more green. And this needs to be um, at the center of the transition and the, and the priorities of institution when looking uh, towards the future. And something that we also have found out in ESU through the survey that I mentioned before with uh, Croatian uh, Ministry, uh, but also through um, uh, other research that we have done uh, about uh, the Bologna process and its implementation, mental health um, is, a, is, is, is seen as a priority by National Union of Students and should be seen as such by ministries and institutions. And unfortunately, at the moment, it's not in many places. There is not, um, there, there is no, uh, not a lot of um, efficient counseling for students, not enough support for students who need it. And unfortunately, during the time of the, of the pandemic and the crisis that we are going through, the mental health of students has deteriorated and there is an increased need for support and counseling. And this is something that we really want to raise um, uh, like concern about and that really needs to be taken into account in the future. So this is my, my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions or if we are going to, to take them in the, in the end. Uh, thank you, Helen. Um, I think we'll have enough time in the end to answer some questions that are being raised on Mentimeter. I still um, would like to thank you for this um, really thorough insight about the challenges of post pandemic and accessibility and the support system. Uh, I personally um, suffered from lack of internet connection in my resist, uh, residence. And um, for example, one of the needs I had was to access the libraries for books for my um, research, which I couldn't. So that was a really good point. Thank you so much. I would like to um, remind uh, the participant and the listeners the Mentimeter code is uh, on the chat. It's 553739. I'm going to um, post it again. We will be looking for your questions. Okay, so the second part of the session three is uh, going to be presented by Juan Rayon. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Um, Royan is 26 years old from Spain. Uh, he is the president of ESN Spain and Lezon Officer for Inclusive Mobility. He is studying Masters in high, um, high European and International Studies in the University of Granada. And um, in this, uh, his title of the presentation would be Social Responsibility, Community Outreach During and After COVID-19 Crisis. Uh, Juan, if uh, yes. you're there. Can you hear me well? Yeah, okay, I'll Perfect. leave you for it. Perfect, I'm gonna share my screen. 
Okay, thank you so much. First of all, it's a pleasure being here with all of you, and also a pleasure sharing the this topic with Helen. Helen was in our comp in, in our Social Erasmus Plus final conference last October, and it was very nice listening to her again. And well, I'm going to talk a bit about let's say the topics connected to social responsibility and internationalization, and more specifically about mobility and how. It has affected, um, it has been affected by the COVID-19 crisis, but also the important role that internationalization can play in the recovery. So in order to, to better understand the topic, we need to, to take a look at the topic of internationalization of higher education for society. Many times when we speak about mobility, we stay there, okay? No, everyone knows about the Erasmus Plus program going abroad and everything nowadays. But many people are not aware of the importance of developing comprehensive international strategies that really aim to bring change. So it's not only about creating a change on the students and on the institutions, but actually to go beyond them and to try to create an impact on society. Okay, so that's why we are talking more and more about this concept of internationalization for society, in which through different actions, that are included in the topic of internationalization, we're trying to improve our communities. This is something we have been working with in ESM for the last years through several programs like uh, Social Erasmus or like Exchange Civility and many other actions. Okay. First of all, I'm gonna explain you a bit the situation that we faced as an organization during the last months, which was as you, can, as you could see in Joanna's presentation, in the first presentation that we had, more or less half of the students that were doing mobilities abroad in Europe stayed in their Erasmus exchanges. And honestly, I was very happy about that. I was very happy to see that the students decided to stay. Of course, in, in some cases, they wanted to go back to the countries and they did, and this is perfectly fine. But for me, it was nice to see that the students were willing to stay in the destinations and to live this difficult experience in the Erasmus destinations, which, which I think can be very enriching. But then as an organization, what we thought is, okay, we have a lot of students, some of them alone in their houses, many of them facing challenges. First of all, we thought, how can we help those students? And second of all, how can we keep them engaged? How can we keep them engaged with their new, with their new reality, with their hosting communities, with other international students? So they don't feel lonely, but also so they better understand the things that are going through, you know, the things that are happening. And then, of course, we thought, okay, what can be your role as a student association? What can we do? Because we think it's very important not to just, let's say, ask the university for actions, but also reflect on the role that we can have in such a complicated situation. In order to develop our strategy, we took into account three different aspects. First, first of all, the importance of fighting the infodemic. We have a lot of students being in countries which are, some of them are not very familiar to their new realities because they have just arrived. Some of them, they have not, um, like they don't have a lot of awareness about the country and they are very likely to, to find a lot of fake news, a lot of uh, misleading information, contradiction information, and that, can, and that can be very challenging for them. So as an organization that is so close to the students, it was very important for us to really try to connect the students with the right type of information, with scientific facts, try to educate them in the importance of media literacy. And this is something we really tried to do in the, during the last months. Then the second key aspect was the connection with the hosting community. Of course, it's much easier to connect the students with their hosting communities, with their new cities, through physical activities. But we thought it was very important to make the students aware of the things that were going on in their hosting cities and in their countries. Then the third thing, which was probably the most challenging one, was to keep the sense of belonging to the what we call the Erasmus generation, to make them feel part of the Erasmus generation, to try to organize these activities in which they can connect with other students, with local people, and so on. With all this in mind, we develop our campaign of Erasmus at Home. With Erasmus at Home, we created a hashtag in which we were tagging all the activities that we were organizing during the pandemic. And we also created a portal 
within our general portal of activities.dsn.org, in which four sections, we have around 530 sections in Europe, could register their activities and people could see them and join. Okay, and within like within this portal, we could find all kinds of activities. You could find activities ranging from tandems, uh, lectures about particular topics, debates, uh, activities with the schools, as we will see later, and so on. But then we wanted we wanted to use this help these hashtags also to let's say educate students on how can they how could they keep engaging with, with communities even while in lockdown. So we we differ from say two blocks. First of all, were the actions related to contributing to the global community. So let's say global actions, actions that are not that connected to the local reality. You can see here the list. This is, this is a non-exhaustive list which, which we created. Um, we want to, to give examples to the students so they could see how even while being at home, there were many ways to contribute to society. It was very important to keep on contributing during your mobility. We think mobility is the perfect opportunity to do these kind of actions and the results were very, very good. And then of course, the second part are the mobility act, the local actions. So these ones are more connected to the hosting communities. Again, this is a not exhaustive list, okay? We just created these materials to guide the students in the many opportunities that they can find. But the best thing about the local actions was that our sections found all kinds of initiatives in which Erasmus students could contribute to hosting communities. Just to give you a really practical example, one of our flagship initiatives is Erasmus in Schools in which Erasmus students and pupils meet in classes to talk about any kind of topic related to interculturality, related to the value of mobility and so on. Many of our sections around Europe tried to implement these initiatives like from home and the result is very, very good. Okay, teaching us that we can actually continue with social impact initiatives even while being at home. The feedback from the students it's also very good because then also local pupils are very, most of them, they need to be locked in with their families without seeing their friends. And then it's very good to have that interaction with international people, which can bring a fresh perspective and then let's say break a bit with the routine. But then, of course, like in the last months, while thinking how can we help during the pandemic, we have dedicated a lot of time to think what comes next. What can we do in the future semesters? How can we help communities through internationalization even after the pandemic is stable? Okay, and of course not over because it will take a while for the pandemic to be really over, but we know that in the first semesters we will have mobility. So then it is time to think which actions we can bring about to help that internationalization, not only of students and of institutions, but also of communities at large. And, and for that, and this is very connected to some of the topics that Helen addressed before, we consider some of the main challenges that we'll search after the, the hardest point, which are the risk of more exclusive mobility, which means that due to the socioeconomic impact of the pandemic, less students will be able to go abroad. We will need to rethink, also as Helen said, the ways in which we can support students to go abroad, the types of grants, how to explore different types of blended mobility, and so on. And then also very linked to this, the reduction of real interactions, which is a crucial feature of any mobility, and which might provoke that the students that are going abroad are actually learning less in terms of intercultural learning, citizen competences, and so on, that they should be learning. And, and this is a big problem for an association like ours. And then of course, the, let's say the global trends related to nationalism and anti-globalism, which we think that internationalization may help to tackle some of these problems. And then we need to design the proper activities and the proper actions to, to foster that international mindset, that character of trying to embrace a uh, diversity and so on. First of all, we were very lucky because we were already doing a project that was very connected to these topics. Uh, for like for the last six months, we have been working in the CM project, which aims to first widen participation of 
students in Erasmus Plus Mobilities, and then second, foster engagement of students with local pupils in order to increase participation in mobility, so in kind of feedbacks itself. We think this project is, more, is now more relevant than ever, and with all the findings that we are hoping to get from the, the survey that we are running right now, we, we really hope to contribute to the debate in the next, in the next months. And then, of course, we are already thinking about which kind of actions can universities can implement in collaboration with our local organizations, but also with other student associations like ESU, like, like the local level of ESU, like student councils, and any kind of student associations, to once again go beyond the university walls and try to help communities. We have many programs and many initiatives that are connected to this that are going to be now more relevant than ever. Because if we're going to have Erasmus students with less physical classes, these students are going to have less opportunities to interact with different people. And the so-called Erasmus bubble is going to be much more likely to happen. Then initiatives like these ones, in which Erasmus students with ESM volunteers go to schools, go to community centers, meet with local associations contributing in topics like disability, refugee education can be very, very relevant and very, very useful to help internationalize municipalities and also neighborhoods, if you're talking about big cities, like, like the ones that compose the Unica network. Of course, with these initiatives, we are helping students to learn values and participation with dynamics of, of co-creation in which universities and students can design the activities and go to the communities and then have that bi-directional learning which people like the ones participating in these activities for instance it was an activity related to to migrants and refugees and international students can learn okay so we need now more than ever a lot of civic participation we need to educate students in the importance of democratic coexistence and so on and this kind of internationalism strategies are key to achieve so then, of course, intercultural learning, as I, as I was saying before, is at the centerpiece of any mobility experience. And it's very hard to achieve that only through, through online mobilities. We know that probably mobility will suffer some restrictions. In, for instance, big groups of people will not be able to gather. But these concrete activities and projects in which small groups of students interact with local communities and with other local students can be very helpful for both the students and communities, and as, as I was saying before. Okay, so we encourage universities to explore all these initiatives along with the students to co-design and co-create all the, all the possible projects that can be implemented. Basically, as a conclusion, uh, we believe that community engagement is a crucial part of the mobility experience. It's, 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 a, it's a very timely topic now that we are seeing things like racism and like multilateralism being criticized. We need to, to show people beyond the usual suspects, so beyond the international community, beyond the students which are already engaged in international topics. That is very, very important. And we believe that the way to go is to foster cooperation between universities and student organizations. We also know that the tools are there because we have been implementing these kind of initiatives for many years. But now is the time to make it the norm. Okay? Now is the time to be more ambitious and to really make it just another part of mobility. Yes, understand mobility um, as an experience in which participation at the local level and social impact activities are just something normal. If we do this, we will be working towards the real goals of the Erasmus Plus program and the real goals of the Bologna process as well. Okay, so that was all. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Okay, thank you so, so much, Juan. It was a really um, interesting presentation. Um, you gave us insight about what can student associ associations do to um, to to find solutions uh, for the urge of uh, making um, internationalism movement happen still in post pandemic era and um, to keep engaging the students internationally.
So um, we finished the presentations for this session. I uh, would like to thank you both, Helen and Yuan, and uh, I would like to um, share my screen so we can start with your questions. Okay, so um, the first question is, can a global university be set up dedicated to only online courses for all over the globe? Faculties could be from different institutions all over the globe and contributing through their video lectures, Zoom meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Very interesting question. Um, let's see who would like to answer. If I, if I may. Um, yeah, so I think, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure, probably this kind of initiative uh, already somehow exists, maybe not in the form of a global university, but there are most likely platforms. Uh, in that sense. But I would say, and this is the position uh, of, of the European Students' Union, um, for us, whereas um, online classes and the use of digital tools can be a big plus um, for, for higher education and for, for students, uh, we strongly believe that this should not be the only way um, for students to attend classes and to get their knowledge. So digital tools, online classes, online group projects, uh, etc. Um, are super interesting, but they need to be used in combination with uh, presential and physical um, activities. Um, so that would be the, my answer on the position of ESU. And I think outside of the, of the fact that we advocate for uh, blended forms of learning and not only digital, uh, such a situation with a global university with only online courses would also raise the question of the, of the quality assurance of the, of the classes that uh, would, be, would be given there. And uh, it, it would raise uh, new issues in, in terms of quality assurance, but also in terms of, uh, let's say, equal opportunities. Even though this can be a great tool for students who do not have access to physical, um, physical classes, physical uh, higher education, uh, having on, on one side physical, physical institutions and on the other side online institutions could contribute to even more create a two-speed higher education where people who cannot access the physical ones go online and, and it creates inequalities as well. So what really needs to be done is to find proper ways of having both uh, sides included in, in current universities. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, if there's no other comments to be added, I would go to the next question. Um, so the next question is, do you, um, do universities have a role in helping out their surrounding community during the pandemic? How can students help? Might be a question for Juan. Yeah, I mean, as, as I was saying, that's totally our position, right? I think it is important to understand the university, let's say, as as, a, as an aggregation of all the bodies that are actually within the university. So the university is not only the staff, the university is not only the people working for the university, but the students are also part of the university. And when I, we believe in ESN that the, um, the, social, like the, the social mission of universities is a crucial one, and that indeed there are multiple ways in which universities can help. Of course, during the pandemic, it, it might be a bit more complicated and a bit more specific, but it already happened and I'm thinking about universities helping with protective equipment, universities helping with laboratories, with universities helping in many several ways. But then of course now we are more in the, in the stage of the reconstruction in the post-COVID era, let's say. And there it's even more important because there is about, it's all about the topics that Helen was mentioning before, it's all about I guess uh, fostering cohesion, trying to foster inclusion. And their universities have a crucial role because universities are a, are a social elevator and they can help, com they, not only they can, they must, they should and must help communities to prosper. And I think um, students will help more and more if they organize, if they organize in student associations like ours, and they are able to collaborate and co-create different strategies with the university leadership and with the staff to identify which are the different challenges in which students can, 
can contribute. Okay, of course, in in our site, since we work a lot with interculturality, diversity, and everything, those are the topics that we feel are more urgent. But there are many other topics in which students can have a great impact. There, first of all, I think like volunteering and volunteering projects, uh, forms of service learning should be included in almost all curricula. And when we talk about internationalizing the curricula, we're also talking about that, right? About teaching and learning about the different problems of our, of our time in university so students can better understand how they can contribute towards, like towards, for instance, the sustainable development goals. In the future years, this will be even more important. So as a short answer, of course, they can contribute and there are many different ways. And ESU and YSM have many different options to do that. Thank you so much. So we can move to next question. Um, so how universities avoid the social economic divide created by distance learning? Yes, so to elaborate further on, on what I mentioned in the in my presentation. I think it's one of the roles of university to actually invest time and reflection and research and also money into finding a way to make the, the, the learning experience um, actually inclusive, especially in, in the challenging times that we're going through. So it's finding, finding ways of, uh, well, first of all, as I was mentioning before, infrastructure making sure that throughout the, the, the university owned building, so not only the, the classroom, et cetera, but also within the, the dorms, for instance, um, there, is the, there are the tools for students to actually uh, follow. Um, it's also as it's a situation in some countries that university can allocate some grants and scholarships to students. Uh, it can also be, they can also be rethought in the way that there is material support or financial support allowing students to as well invest and, and, and have the, the sufficient and efficient tools uh, for them to, to actually learn uh, in a distance manner. Um, but it, it's the university's role, but I think we must also not forget the role of the higher education systems that they are included in. So the, the, the governance of, of higher education in general in a given countries. And both universities and students have their voice, uh, have their, yeah, their, their, their voice into, uh, in the decisions that are made for uh, said systems. So they are consul consulted by the ministries um, uh, and they can actually uh, also join forces together to, to shape uh, better higher education systems with uh, efficient support systems, providing the tools and, uh, and, and the right things for students to, to be able to follow uh, classes and take exams, even though they are at home. So I think it's, um, we need to look at the bigger picture. Of course, universities can do things and can uh, invest time and reflection and money into how to make the future better. But there is only so much that university can do, uh, especially when it comes to support systems. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, let's see, I think we can go through one last question. I will just um, open the next one. I'm so sorry we won't have time to go through all the questions. So, do you think social services at universities are responding well to the situation? Any good examples? Do you have any comments? I may start. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, you start. Okay. I mean, once again, it's we need to first of all understand the situation. So, no one was prepared for it. Of course, they can respond well to a certain extent. I think. If, uh, uh, as, at least as far as I know, they have tried hard. We, we, need, we have very different situations to be addressed. And that was very challenging. Uh, but I think, of course, they have been overwhelmed by the situation, especially for the things that we're talking about, for the technological divide that made like um, very complicated for some students to have access to internet, um, like laptops and, and so on. Uh, but then again, of of course, I also know like some very good examples, for instance, in the field of disability, 
in Spain with the disability offices doing a, a great job. But then we have a big difference with services that are responsible to work with small numbers of people or, or, or services which have to offer services to a big number of people. So what we, we need to learn lessons, of course, from the situation and we need to develop our resilience capacity. And that is crucial. Once again, it, the best way to avoid problematic situations in terms of like social services being overwhelmed is to create a pre-red distribution, which allows students to not to need to use social services so often. So for instance, if we understand that we're moving to a, like to an education format in which online or blended learning is the norm, maybe as was said before, Universities, but not, not all universities, education systems, university systems, higher education systems need to provide the tools for every student, which could make sense, right? I mean, if I'm a student in university and I'm starting with a scholarship, but then I don't have money to cover a normal laptop, of course, I'm going to be in a situation of inequality. So basically, I think, yes, they did a great job. They put a lot of effort, but we need to develop resilience to be prepared to similar situations and in general, to ensure more, more equity in our higher education systems. Thank you so much, Juan. If Helen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, well, uh, I think Juan said uh, the, the most important things uh, when it comes to good examples. Well, there have there have been examples uh, across across Europe where university uh, social services were really there for the students, helped them uh, be able to stay in the dorms for longer periods, for instance. We also had examples where universities were providing uh, laptops for students who didn't have any. I think it was the case, for instance, at the University of Malta uh, and also in some universities in Belgium. Like You, you had to prove that you, you didn't have any kind of uh, laptop that was functioning and the university will try to help find a solution for you at least to be able to take uh, the exams. Um, but yeah, as one mentioned, I think um, uh, we cannot really put all the blame on university as the situation was not really uh, expected and they had to react quite fast. But as I was mentioning in my presentation, I think the crisis in a way helped showcase what was already what were already problems before and 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 that's where I think there is an important learning point. Uh, let's see what happened in the past few months. And, and how and where we can go from there and, and, and what we can do to make the situation um, a bit better. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, um, I would like to close the screen sharing. Okay, here we are. So officially I can um, close the, the third session. Um, the topic was the future of the social impact of universities. We talked about challenges in post-pandemic um, era, such as um, issues regarding accessibility, support system, internationalism, related issues, and how to tackle them in post-pandemic era. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I would like to um, invite Kaleen, I think to um, take the floor and yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Padia. Um, maybe let, let's just get all the moderators here to, and I can ask you if you have any final remarks about your sessions, if you want to leave any final uh, comments before we close. So Kelly, Anna and Padia, thank you so much for a great job. And do you have any final remarks that you want to share? Uh, yeah, 